Financial Security. My name is Michelle and I'll be helping with today's session. I'd like to introduce you to our presenter today. Debbie Dolan is a security expert and global knowledge instructor who has pro been providing technical solutions and training since 1975. Thanks so much for being here with us today, Debbie. Welcome and I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Michelle. I'd like to welcome everyone to this particular webinar on physical security. What's really growing with our physical security is the idea of where do our boundaries end. Again, as we reach into the cloud, let alone get more sophisticated components into our environments, we have embedded systems, we reach out to all kinds of different organizations for little snippets of services, and pretty soon it isn't so clear cut anymore just where are the boundaries of our organization. So physical security, all about that aspect of can you touch it, and if you can touch it, there's the understanding that you can own it. Do we really know who's touching stuff? So I start this whole thing off with the idea of going to the cloud. You are relinquishing control when you go to the cloud. The question becomes, do you even know where your data is geographically located? Many organizations are simply seeking bottom dollar. Where can I host this the cheapest? Where can I provide for some kind of cloud service because everybody's going to the cloud? And surely it can offer you lots of cost savings as well as a whole bunch of synergy as your people can start working together with different time zones and working from wherever they happen to be located. But you have to consider who all can touch it. What happens when you're not having your data hosted and is it being swapped out to where? Is the company that you've contracted to in turns contracting to yet other organizations? So going too deep into the cloud is actually stepping into another lecture, but it's impossible to get into physical security without considering today's physical constraints, which are kind of disappearing from what our old school mentality was. We had the concept of a perimeter network. If you couldn't break through the perimeter, there's no way you're getting to anything inside. And yet today everybody's wearing their computer on them and they're reaching into the cloud for services, both personal and corporate. So again, mapping. We can't just map our internal structures. We have to map logically where are all the different places that we have data located. If in fact you are the one providing the services, what kind of services do you supply? Do you have shared space? In which case, who can actually access the physical computer? How are the people trained, selected? Do you go into background investigations? Again, it could be you as a provider or you going to a provider. And for these employees, what's their access to get into the data? Despite what it might be that the organizational structure dictates, people don't always do what they're asked to do if no one follows up on them, if there's no application of the governance that's developed. Unfortunately, we live in an environment where everybody's been very focused on, this is what I learned how to do, and hopefully I'm doing it well. And yet, typically, IT people have not been trained into writing service level agreements. It is critical that we have good service level agreements written so that you know you are compliant. You need to go back over your existing contracts, find out what kind of dictates they put upon you as to what constraints do you have to provide. We go out to the cloud. Again, we deal with a lot of virtual environments that don't agree with the idea that you can't have this on a computer with other services, which is sometimes written into sensitive contracts. So teaching your regulatory demands is certainly outside the dominion of this kind of curriculum. You have to do your due diligence and make sure that you know the regulatory constraints that your organization falls under and then you need to look into compliance. So as we move forward, we are going to focus on the physical security of your stuff. But you need to keep drawing back in your head, gee, am I being compliant? What kind of things and implications do I need to consider? We say that your physical secu security is your first line of defense. I mentioned if they can touch it, they can own it. Truly, if you don't have physical security, there's no security. It has offended people in the security arena with IT to say, why do I have to learn physical security? That's another branch in our company. They'll do the physical security. And the bottom line is no. As an IT professional, you have to be aware of what the physical constraints are. 
everything about the organization, including physical security, is integrated into our networks. We have to know who's interacting with the components of the network, where these components could fail, who can reach the components. So certainly who's getting into the organization at any level is going to be of big concern to your IT professional. And once you have determined what kind of constraints you need, now you have to build a strong policy that dictates that. By definition, policy is mandatory compliance. So once it's been written, it is in effect mandated. Now you've got to train your people so they know what's expected of them. And then as you continuously monitor, make sure that you're enforcing with whatever are the penalties dictated by your policy. You must enforce policy or it's as good as not written. I mentioned physical security is our first line of defense and certainly one of the most classic types of access control we can have are locks. But of course if you want to have different areas for different levels of access you're going to have to have lots of locks and pretty soon you start this massive key ring and the emphasis I'm trying to make is security is an inconvenience. The more you add, the more people have to track, manage, could lose, could start falling through the cracks. The only way to prevent that is to clearly and concisely dictate what will be required and, like I said, monitor it continuously and enforce it. The more that you can integrate these access controls into the rest of the environment, the more seamless it becomes for your people to have to pass through. It'll still be an inconvenience, but you can try to help cut down on some of the inconveniences by proper planning. Keep in mind, the more inconveniences you make on people, the more they're going to try to undermine your security, the more you're going to upset them. Upset people get flustered. Flustered people make mistakes. It goes in full circle. This actually becomes one of your risks. So, as we're dealing with the solutions, it's really important that you need to consider what will be the impact on the overall integration. How much will it slow down productivity? How much will it impede the performance of the individuals? How much will it delay the start of a particular process that needs to initiate? Every single solution is a double-edged knife, and I mean security solution. We bring some kind of security solution into our environments to help us out, but it always introduces new problems. And that's the difficult part of trying to do any kind of risk calculation. You can't simply start subtracting off risk because you've added a particular control. You have to also acknowledge what new risk is going to be brought in because you added that control. So every new solution bears new risks. This risk assessment process is where you have to go in and identify everything you have of value or your assets. Every asset is going to have vulnerabilities or weaknesses and then threats can do damage to those. When you have a threat that is manifest, there will be a certain amount of exposure. So as we discuss the world of risk management, the first step in it is risk assessment. What do you have? What is the amount of risk given the fact that risk is both good and bad. Risk is simply the study of probability. There are pros, there are cons. As you're analyzing your risk, although there are plenty of books, plenty of templates, you have to modify them, you have to shape them to your own organization. A global company is going to have some different risk than a small local store, then would have a public school, then would have a, a private school. So in all of these cases, you have different amounts of reputation as an asset, your customers, morale as an asset, both tangible and intangible, need to be recognized. Public awareness of your company as to who wants to attack you is going to differ. So you have to take into account where you're geographically located, what kind of line of work you do, how lucrative that is as to who wants to get into your stuff. I mean, just everything about are you publicly traded, are you a private organization, all of this is going to carry different risk. Now top that with the fact that the FBI indicates that over 70% of our damages are caused by employees, and not necessarily by fraud and sabotage. It can be simply negligence as well. 
the well-meaning employee overburdened and or improperly trained not knowing what kind of results are going to occur from the mismanagement that they're doing in their daily efforts. Certainly add on top of that the fact that we do have moles or we have disgruntled employees that you've already given credentials to, you have trained them how you do business, now if they want to do damage, they can easily do more damage than someone trying to break in from the outside. So 5% of our attacks are coming from external sources. Take all of this with a grain of salt as to who's really internal, external, as again we go to cloud services and suddenly internal isn't just your own company employees, but the ISP provider that you are in fact relinquishing your control over to. They all become insiders as well. So simply defining who's inside, outside can be a major undertaking. The fact that this is such an immense undertaking has led many people to kick off with a qualitative instead of a quantitative, to simply get the job done in a few months and know what we're working with. But ultimately you have to follow behind with a detailed quantitative. And that can still be such a mind-boggling task that we have lots of companies out there that this is all they do for a living. They come in and they perform your risk assessment. Here again, though, recognize the need for non-disclosure agreements, carefully choosing your team, because you're showing them everything that's weak about your company when you bring someone in for this. So it, it's a big undertaking to embark upon with a lot of considerations about the implications. You use only internal, trusted people. You're going to have a learning curve where people don't really understand the process very well. You bring in outsiders to it. Well, now you're going to have deficiencies because of what you reveal to them, and again, whether they're going to actually do a good job or not. Certainly, if you do bring in people from outside, you want to use some of your people inside so you don't lose that whole knowledge base when the outsiders leave. What we've been talking about are those things that you have of value have to have vulnerabilities, weaknesses. It could be a vulnerability in the way it was created. It could be a vulnerability because you left it sitting at its defaults. It could be a vulnerability of an employee that was untrained. It could be a vulnerability because of the things you combined together, either technically or managerially, operationally. You didn't have separation of duties. All of these provide vulnerabilities. Threats are things that can exploit vulnerabilities and risk is the probability that that threat will actually manifest. As you're considering these risks of the threats, you have to determine how much exposure, how much loss of my asset. We usually talk in terms of percentages. What do you stand to lose? The other aspect of the threat you have to analyze is what's the probability? Is it going to happen 10 times a year or is it going to happen one time every 10 years? Again, this is what we mean by risk the probability that the threat will occur causing the exposure. Then hopefully we're going to be able to mitigate. Those are coming up with countermeasures. Recognizing you already have some countermeasures in place, surely you've got a lock on the door, or, you know, something in place. You have to make an awareness of what is out there and how well is it working for you. And then come in with additional countermeasures. But here is that part that IT doesn't always get. The fact that it isn't a war that you can just throw money into forever and ever as a bottomless hole, you've got to stop at some point. And the point at which you stop throwing in countermeasures is the point at which you have met or exceeded how much you stand to lose. So managing business risk is this whole process of having performed the risk analysis, trying to mitigate recognized risk down to an acceptable level without ever exceeding what you stand to lose in terms of your annual loss expectancy, which is bringing together the probability together with the exposure. Well, this is already pretty tough. How many companies run down to their insurance company and declare, wow, that was a fantastic attack last night. We lost everything, probably a billion dollars. We don't know if we'll ever get it back. The problem is we don't have actuaries. This whole ability to go out statistically, how many companies lose how much stuff in this particular field, is pretty unavailable. 
your best understanding of exposures is going to come from your own history of having performed incident management, of having done proper disaster recovery. Your own experience is going to be immense in helping you understand what exposures do you stand to lose. And here's where poor documentation is failing us. People are so focused on get in there, fix it, get it back up, and now reflect, what did you do? <laughs> Let me sleep for two days, then I'll tell you what I did. Well, guess what? In two days' time, you're not going to remember what you did. So with poor record management, we don't even know our own historical information properly. So this huge field of business risk brings in all of these considerations, together with the fact that no matter what solution you do add, you're creating new threats of exposures because of vulnerabilities. So risk good and bad. Some have absolutely no appetite for risk. These lead to some very permissive cultures within security or extremely paranoid cultures within security. So not only is there no perfect cure to any kind of situation that ails you, but the security professional simply has to be experienced on what are all the tools that I can throw into my bag of tricks so that when I walk into a company, I can learn about their corporate culture and help management devise an appropriate solution because there will be a unique solution to every organization. Again, their appetite for risk as well as the type of business they're doing as to just what is going to be the probability of a threat coming in. This is where we talk about doing threat profiling and monitoring, trending over time. Here again is an important aspect of incident response. As you try to establish the root cause, or eradicate the root cause so this thing won't ever happen to you again, if you're not doing proper bookkeeping of what keeps happening to you, you're not able to do the trending over time, you may find there's a dramatically different root cause than the one you've been treating. That all goes into this threat profiling. Again, every asset's going to have different issues. As you come up with your countermeasures, you have to figure out not just the cost to acquire it, but the cost to train your people, the cost to keep it maintained, the cost to replace it because everything fails over time, the cost to integrate. Will it, in fact, be compatible with the other things that you already have in the environment? So a lot of costing goes into this. You compare that with the costing of the actual damage or loss, which is where we started from with that exposure concept and then you have to make the decision. Are you simply going to accept the risk because you can't afford to take the uh, countermeasure? Are you, in fact, going to stop doing that line of work, which will now introduce other risk to you? Are you going to subcontract it and assign the risk to somebody else, but now you have the risk of their failure to perform? Are you going to buy insurance such that you still have the risk, but maybe you can help deal with it should it arise better? All of these are what is your choice for risk strategy? So back to the overwhelming term, <laughs> risk management, that so many people, when they hear, they want to go running for cover. It is that act of coming to terms with what risk do you have, the risk assessment, considering the entire corporate environment, both the internal risk and the external risk, and coming up with a strategy where you clearly define what is the acceptable risk. It's impossible to remove all risk but your goal is to lower the recognized risk to the acceptable level as you add in your compensating controls, whatever is the operational, technical, uh, managerial countermeasures that you can come up with. Truly, the best bang for the buck is typically developing additional governance and training your employees, employees being that weakest link. But ultimately, it will be a variety of the different kinds of controls, physical, where we're mostly focused here, the administrative, which is governance, and then finally technical, the things that you add into your network. Start with the right environment. 
think of the inconveniences or conveniences that you're going to have in terms of action or inaction. For example, depending on the situation of whatever it is that you're trying to provide for with your physical security, it may be that you only let people in and out periodically. In that case, you're going to have to provide for long-term keeping them in there, you know, food, lodging, some type of protection for that general purpose living day to day. Again, it all depends on what's the kind of work that you do in the first place. We're trying to protect confidentiality, integrity, and availability from the physical arena. Well, for availability, it's no single point of failure. Spare parts, spare utilities, spare couriers, multipath for your communication channels. It's also, though, acquiring the appropriate facilities. Even if your people don't have to stay there for a long time, you still want to provide for that feeling of safety. You want to make sure that the buildings meet code because you can't believe the salesperson when you bought it. You want to make sure that fire code is properly established, that you have the right types of extinguishers for the kind of environment and equipment you're going to be setting up. Gas extinguishers in a manned facility isn't a real smart thing for caring about your people. So in terms of your customers, you again want the lodging, you want them to have transport in and out. All of this is going to improve the public respect for your organization, giving you a good reputation. Keep in mind when you take care of people, they want to take care of you. So this act of putting people first isn't just humanitarian, although that's a nice aspect too. It's the aspect of treating your people right, knowing that it all comes back around again. Fire extinguishers are an issue that almost everybody's going to have to deal with a fire at some point, and yet nobody wants to think about it. It's kind of like, what kind of backups do you want to do? People think, well, hopefully it'll just never fail. Same thing with fire extinguishers. It's too late once the fire comes in. If it's going to be a gas extinguisher, that would typically be for an unmanned center. By definition, they displace oxygen, they're deadly. CO2, you can't even smell it. I mean, it's odorless, but it's going to kill everybody around. Halon was effective, but it's banned. It's destroying our ozone faster than everything else combined. So there's lots of alternatives out there that are good. Carbon dioxide, probably one of the more prevalent, because it's what we call an ABC extinguisher. It can handle both your common paper, wood fires, your ash fires. It can handle your barrel of your liquids, your Class B fires, and the ones that we're typically looking at at circuits, our Class C fires. The issue, however, is when water comes in, which may not be because you had a water extinguisher, but could be because the fireman's breaking through the wall and carrying his hose with it, that's going to turn into carbonic acid. Now, they should have their masks on, so hopefully carbon dioxide won't hurt them at that point too much. But again, you, you've got to balance everything. If it's going to be gas, try to have it to be the unmanned centers and consider the ramifications when water meets with that element. Water definitely damages computers, doesn't work well with electricity, and yet most of our building codes demand that you have water. So now it's a matter of making sure you have the proper type. Wet pipes are the kind you normally find in motels with these little notices, don't hang your hangers here, because they have a sprinkler head that whenever whatever the detector is goes off, that water is coming down. And if you trigger it, guess what? You're going to have a flooded room. Well, we have problems with them being set off too quickly, as well as the fact that the pipes can leak. So then we have dry pipe, where the water is held back with a compressed gas, so that now when the trigger goes off, the gas is released first, then the water comes down. That would be a little bit better. And I've seen that used quite often in our pharmacies, too, to make sure there's no water damage. But the best kind for the data center is what we call a pre-action. I've also seen it called delay. It's kind of a combination of the other two. It is a dry pipe, so the gas is holding back the water. But then even though the water has filled up, there's still a bit of a delay. The beauty here is if it's a false alarm, you have time to turn it off before the water comes down. If it's not a false alarm, you have time to get the power off before you get out of there. You don't want the water coming down while the power is still turned on. Just keep in mind that generally, if there's a fire, there's going to be water brought to it at some stage. 
when it comes to your power, here's one of our causes of fires, is people don't have the buildings wired properly. One of the places where this is biting us is the more we use power over Ethernet. It's convenient. You can just, anywhere you have a network cable, suddenly you have power as well. But it isn't necessarily feeding off of equipment that is inside of a cabinet that has proper gauge and amperage for your wiring. So be on top of it. Know how much your uh, switches are going to be drawing. And appreciate even our switches that supply PoE to all the ports, they don't normally expect all the ports to be using it. So here again, the switches themselves can be overtaxed, let alone the amperage that they're drawing from the circuitry and the whatever your wiring is. So make sure that the places are wired properly and step it up if you need additional amperage. Furthermore, have your grounding appropriate. I learned this one the hard way. One of my first teams and my programming teams was in this real long building and they knocked out the wall between two rooms right at the center and that was going to be our, our storage area and our work area actually. So we of course did that non fire compliant daisy chaining of your power supplies around the room and had things plugged in and we were just losing stuff. Now it wasn't too badly daisy chained. They were in fact off different circuit outlets. But the bottom line turned out to be because I was the laughing stock of the company at that point. Oh you Dolan can't even keep a computer alive. Turned out that um, both ends of the building had been grounded at opposite ends of the building. And by us having just the network cables connecting, we had made a common circuit between everything. And that was enough to be destroying all of our equipment. So I learned the hard way that grounding really, really is important to have solid grounding, unified grounding. And if you're in an area with lots of lightning storms or even an occasional bad lightning storm, consider getting in some lightning arresters and check them periodically. Nothing is meant to be hit with lightning, it will melt. But if it absorbs some of that static of a nearby lightning strike, it's probably going to be damaged. We do have some that can repair themselves for a period of time, but you've got to check them periodically and make sure, especially if you're building with a lot of antennas, make sure that these are being protected. Have the appropriate backups. Short-term backup, use a UPS, a strong enough one or high enough battery powered that you're going to be able to provide a graceful shutdown. But remember that batteries leak, and we have different types. We have offline, we have online, we have inline. The inline and the offline are the cheaper ones. I'd say the cheapest is offline. Offline and inline is referring to the power that's coming to you. And I'm actually using the wrong term. The inline is the highest. On, now I'm getting these confused. The online is the highest quality. Basically what's happening with the online is you're getting the power all the time from the UPS. So if the power goes out, you have no glitch. You are simply going to keep receiving it from the battery, but the battery won't be being charged anymore. So again, you have to stay on top of whether you have good batteries or not. The inline and the offline are the two cheaper ones where with the offline, you're simply getting the power from the wall, and when that power drops off, you're switched over to the battery. There's that little bit of a glitch as you pass over. The inline, you're being filtered from the wall, but there's still, you have to cross over to get the power from the battery. What you choose is dependent on how much money you want to pay, as well as just everything about the importance of your environment. But ideally, you don't want things like brownouts, where your equipment can't figure out if it's shutting down or starting up. And the offline and the inline can have more damage resulting from that type of a brownout. But again, how big these batteries are should provide for a graceful shutdown of the environment. It's a generator that you want for long-term provisioning. And we typically say for physical defenses like your physical intrusion detection, you want to make sure that you have a minimum of 24 hours. We have standards where the power company can be notified if, in fact, your power is cut, not waiting for you to have to notify them. Again, it depends on how much you want to subscribe to. But ultimately, how much backup you have for the generator is going to depend on who are you. If you're a hospital, you're going to need more than 24 hours. So we just tend to say a minimum of 24 hours. But here, 
we've run into situations where people don't have sufficient backup and redundancy and just one thing failing like the solenoid that switches you over from regular power to generator power going down and breaking can mean you're out even though you had the generator. If you forget to buy gas for the generator that can be a problem. So again choosing the appropriate contingencies and then staying on top of them. No leaking batteries, proper gas, proper testing. And as soon as we start running cables through the ceiling, which most people do, around the ducting that we use for heating, cooling, remember those are plenum spaces, you need plenum cabling. Plenum is usually made out of Teflon or floral polymers that won't be toxic. I hear a lot of people say, oh, I want plenum because it's not flammable. <laughs> no, it's just as flammable as the rest of the world. However, it won't be toxic when it catches on fire. So. Remember, anywhere around those ducting, you're required by code to be using plenum cabling. Keep in mind, on top of that plenum cabling, you might also have shielded cabling to help cut down on any kind of crosstalk and noise, the EMI, RFI, from the various things up in the ceiling that you might be putting these cables around. And consider the need for anyone who goes up in the ceiling, such as maintaining something to do with your HVAC, you have to monitor them very carefully because often the cables are being run right along in there too. With your heating and air conditioning unit, while it helps to provide protection against temperature and humidity, they don't have to go hand in hand with each other. They're certainly related to each other, but each one can cause its own problems. So you must be sure that you're getting an appropriate HVAC in terms of the size of the unit, obviously it has to be costed for you too, but if you have a unit that's too small, it's going to burn up. And if you have a unit that's too large, what's going to happen is it's going to cool down so rapidly and then start heating back up and cool down so rapidly, you're actually going to have chips start creeping their way out of the sockets. We call it thermal chip creep. So it has to be properly sized. And one of the ways of helping cut back on some of the cost is to use what we call hot and warm or warm and cold aisles. I say hot and warm because I like it warmer, but actually it should be some of it cold. <laughs> Basically we're talking about positioning your racks so that all the intakes are on one side, all the exhaust are on the other side. Anyone that's worked with data centers, this is becoming pretty mainstream mentality. You can have your cooling blow right onto the intakes, sometimes be ducted straight to the intakes, and then your exhaust can even be ducted to the exhaust or, you know, your returns. The benefit is it's a whole lot cheaper to manage the temperature control. Plus, depending on the kind of ducting you use, although it's a little bit more expensive, the area can actually be warmer for human comfort because when it comes to your computing equipment, you want the temperature to be in the low 60s. Your humidity, you want to be around 50%. Well, 50% humidity is okay for people, even though they're quite often used to more like a 60%, I think. But you start getting too little humidity, you're going to have static. You have too much humidity, then you're going to have condensation and corrosion. You get too little temperature. I know some people think, oh, it can't be too little. I don't care if you're comfortable. By golly, we're going to go down to the 50s. Well, depending on how cold you go, you can actually change the metallic characteristics of your equipment, and they'll start working differently than they were designed. You're going to end up with corruption. Certainly, if you let it get too warm, your equipment's going to overheat, and it's going to shut itself off. Once again, you end up with corruption. So it's important to keep both temperature and humidity under control, measure it, monitor it, and one of the ways of doing it is these warm and cold aisles. You typically want a separate unit altogether for your data center, dedicated ducting, so nobody could crawl through. Again, it's kind of a James Bond thing, but you never know. People that are motivated with these disgruntled insiders, they can do some wild things. So by not having that ability for them to crawl through the ducting and not having the ability to have to worry, depending on whether you're monitoring or maintaining that set of ducting or this set of ducting where I have to manage and be on top of you, it just it makes everything a lot simpler. So to the extent possible, keep in mind we're talking about top sensitivity criticality. 
It might be that you're in a spot in Florida where, by golly, for whatever reason, it isn't even appropriate to have HVAC. So there's never a single solution for everybody. But to the extent it is appropriate, consider each of these details. As we've been talking about hardening your environment, we want layered protection in the physical arena ever so much as in the technical arena. We call it compensating controls. If one control fails, you want another one underneath. So starting with your perimeter, what is your access control capability? How can you keep and control the flow to be what you want it to be? And as you layer in from there, every place where people might aggregate, how do you further filter whether they can leave that area and in what direction can they leave? So we need to have access control in order to have area protection. And for all of your considerations and designs, you have to provide continuous, continuous monitoring to make sure it's actually happening. Typically, perimeter control, the most common would be fencing. But here again, it isn't enough to say, I want a fence. We have some fencing called um, PIDUS. PIDUS has built-in intrusion detection. And then people stick this outside. And as soon as a storm comes along or branches blow, you have all kinds of intrusion detection alarms going on. Well, this is great fencing, but it's usually meant for an equipment cage or a forensic lab. It isn't meant for an outside control. So choosing the appropriate fence is going to be important. It may be really pretty to have a stone wall, but it may not be as effective. Now, to the extent that maybe that's acceptable, especially given the, quote, beauty of it, it's not going to be too easy for someone to cut their way through it. Certainly when it comes to privacy fence, it would be a whole lot better to have chain link. A term that we have in the realm of physical security is CPTED. Crime Prevention Through Environmental Deterrence. It refers to using your environment to your benefit. And I see a lot of recent campuses that are built, and I don't mean college campuses, I mean corporate campuses, that have a whole lot of input of this idea of CPTED. It refers to using your environment to your benefit. If you don't want people on that side of the building, then don't put a sidewalk over there. Certainly don't put a picnic bench. If you really don't want them, put a great big pond in over there. So as we consider our fencing, the whole CPTED is given to have prettiness and give a sense of ownership so that your employees embrace it and want to take charge and control. You're bringing out their nesting instinct. But you've got to balance that prettiness with clear visibility. You want to be able to see what's going on. So Big windows in your lobby is good. No windows in your data center is important. And likewise with chain link, you can see to the other side. But it's important to understand the mesh and the gauge of the wire. I mean, if you have something like a half inch mesh and you have six gauge, you just about have a steel wall. <laughs> You're not going to see through that very well. So you don't either want to have three gauge with a 8-inch mesh or you've given somebody a ladder. You don't want it to be sitting on top of the ground where they can simply dig a hole and come underneath it. So the actual substance of the fence is going to be important. But the height, if you only do a 4- to 6-foot fence, you're giving someone an aerobic workout. If you're going to be serious, you want to be 8 feet or taller. And if you're really serious, you're going to want to top it with barbed wire or razor wire pointing in the direction of where you think the person might be coming that would be a perpetrator. Protect your entrances. When I'm saying you want these big glass windows in the lobby, well, you don't want to have um, the classic glass that slivered and went every which way. You're going to want to have tempered glass. On top of that, if it's going to be on a first floor type of environment, you're going to want to probably have some type of a maybe even a bulletproof, but at least sufficient that rocks can't easily fly in and break it. So we've got tons of impregnated glass types. We have one that has RF doping to prevent RF waves from easily going through it. So choosing the right type of glass is going to be important. But if it comes to a car trying to drive through the glass windows, no type of glass is going to help prevent that. You need to have bollards. Bollards are big cement or steel barriers to prevent that kind of thing. So while still providing for the visibility, 
they'll be placed at such intervals that a car couldn't easily just ram right on through. So think of the entrances to your military bases or think of the old alleyways that are converted over to bike paths where they have these steel or cement posts. Those are bollards. So again, design your environment. Don't just grab a building because it had a good sale on. Also don't feel that you have to custom design this building. There are a lot of places out there that will be appropriate for what you're looking for if you take the time to look. Again, back to the idea of using your environment, there's some fantastic bushes out there that nobody would want to meet with their bare skin. Those would be great for planting underneath windows or for planting along the edges of walkways where you don't want people to be coming off those paths. But keep in mind you don't want to have a 10-foot bush sitting next to your walkways either or somebody could be hiding inside of it. So remember, there's going to be good and bad from the protections you choose. You have to consider what are the effects you're after and how could these particular components be abused if not managed properly. This whole beautification, like I said, it brings out the nesting instinct, but it actually boosts morale as well when you let people know it's okay if they bring in a picture from home or you know give something of their own to their environment clearly designating that this is their environment anytime we talk about what controls you can add I hope you take a moment to say and how could this defeat every security control a double-edged knife is going to add you benefit and add problems as you bring in this ability for people to beautify Remember that depending on who gets to pass by, they're going to see more about who this individual is, which in turn can give more fodder to somebody wanting to socially engineer or make a custom dictionary to break into their passwords. So you want to provide this sense of this is your space, but you want to make sure it's sufficiently protected that people don't have to worry about it being exposed to whoever might be passing by. Announce these area restrictions. Where is it that is private space? Where is it that is public space? Clearly put people on report. You know, private hallway. It's only so-and-so is allowed in, you know, in terms of a group of people or something. But these warning signs need to be at every entrance point. And then you have to put them at appropriate intervals. This is the way you can later come and prosecute for trespassing because, in fact, you did give clear notice. It may be that you're in an area where you need multilingual support. Well, consider that. That's really cheap in terms of what the opposite side is of having not given warning to go ahead and make the signs in any language that might be necessary. You need to do the same thing when there's going to be monitoring. If you have cameras in the lobby, well, that's considered public space. You don't need to have any kind of notice. Same thing with the outside of the building. But now, as soon as you start putting them inside of private hall spaces, inside of private offices, which you still might need, classrooms are uh, natural as far as needing to have some kind of monitoring going on there. Well, that's semi-public because students are coming into it. But still, it's appropriate to let people know, like the instructors, that it is subject to monitoring. When we have webinars that are going to be being recorded, it's very important to let the students know the recording's going on. Or well, when the teacher steps out, they might look around and say, well, it's private space, so let's talk about this problem at work. And guess what? It may not be appropriate. So monitoring includes recording. It includes looking at files. It includes having cameras, you know, voice, any kind of audio, any kind of visual recording. Lighting is the most common control we have when it comes to outside. I love these kind of questions, too, that come up in certification exams. What's the most common, and people want one answer? Well, it depends. If we're perimeter, probably fence. If we're outside, probably lighting. If we're perimeter, uh, not perimeter, but building control, it's probably locks. It changes, but use what's appropriate. The lighting isn't only important for a psychological deterrent, it's important for recording. Even though our cameras are getting better and better, you need to make sure that you match the lighting to be effective for the type of recorder that you're using. Very many times people have recorded that somebody went through, but they don't have the resolution to pick up on the face because they didn't have sufficient lighting. 
So when it's going to be for security, you want that level of lighting that you see around an ATM machine at night. If it's simply to help your people feel safe when they're going out to the parking lot at night, well, that would take less lighting. So look into the kind of monitoring requirements, not, and I don't mean monitoring that, yeah, I want to record or not record, but I mean what's the camera that you're going to acquire, and make sure that you have the appropriate candle power to match whatever its capability is for picking things up. Keep in mind, distance is going to play a factor. Whether or not weather can get to it can play a factor. Whether or not people can shoot laser beams at it to blind it. I mean, there's a lot of things on top of what resolution it requires. So with our lighting, keep in mind it's going to help people feel safe. It could be continuous. It could be periodic. It turns on at certain hours. It could be that it's a motion detection, kind of responsive when you walk into the area. It's always a detection type of control. It can be somewhat of a preventative control, too, by putting that sense of, I'm going to catch you if you do something, into the would-be perpetrator's mindset. Try again to be on top of what's appropriate in today's world. It used to be shoot light wherever you could, which meant we had a lot of light that was just going off into lost land. Today it's more try to shoot it down, shoot it to where you want to have it, directional lighting. Don't be shooting it up into the night sky where you destroy the ability to look at the stars. So more and more there's a concentration on reducing that city glow effect. But keep in mind you want it in your lobbies, you want it on human walkways, you want it in your um, garages certainly, you want it in your lo parking lots. When it comes to locks, here I think one of our biggest problems are choosing the right kind of locks. Locks are deterrents. Almost every lock can be bypassed with some type of a picking, a torch, torsion, I can't even say it, wrenches. We have bump keys. I mean, we just have so many means. <laughs> I tell people, go onto YouTube. It's amazing what we're teaching our children as to how to defeat these locks. The ones that are claimed to be the most effective are biometric locks when they're properly installed. Many of our cipher and biometric locks are kind of providing protection one way where you need a credential, either a PIN code or your biometric characteristic, and they tend to be motion detector for releasing. One of the more classic is PIR, passive infrared detection, that while well, I see movement, therefore I'm going to go ahead and release this lock. The end result is that there are all kinds of stories of people blowing up balloons from underneath, people jiggling hangers and things to make a motion such that the doors get unlocked. Now some of these doors will have a silent alarm if they come unlocked during time frames when they're not supposed to be unlocked. That is a compensating control. But the lock itself at that point has failed you. The worst story I was told was this one individual who was working for a company that installed it in the lobby. Again, it was going to be a cipher lock to get in, but what they had was a motion detector to get out, but they had the glass lobby windows, and behind the windows was the receptionist desk, which was on the back wall, backed by a whole flank of mirrors. The end result is all you had to do is stand outside and wave your arms, and the doors would come unlocked. So. Understanding the proper way to install these is critical, but also having them pen tested for appropriateness and readdressing and making sure you stay on top. There will always be new ways to defeat these things. With your cipher locks, consider having delay alarms and hostage alerts. Hostage alerts are special codes that you can teach your people. If they're in a hostage situation, that's what they enter in so that surely they get through, but a silent alarm goes off notifying everybody there's a hostage situation. Or a delay alarm is one that would go off if the door was held open too long to help prevent things like piggybacking and tailgating. So as we have these locks, look for compensating controls. Back to your standard locks, the worst would be a warded lock, like a skeleton key. There's a blockage that the key just fits around. In between, we have things like combination locks where you can use the shim. It just has a little piece of metal that sticks into a slot in the bar of the combination lock. And if you can weasel a shim down in there and push the metal out of the way, you basically have defeated the lock. So the more classic with our locks would be your tumbler locks. 
these actually have a certain number of tumblers depending on the sophistication and the ones that are advertised as anti-pick normally have Teflon around the tumblers to make it easier for them to fall down but again they age Teflon wears off and this is where the bump keys come in where you bump it really hard where all of the tumblers jump up and you can turn the key real quick so understand the types of locks the sophistication of the lock and how these locks can be defeated. In all cases, continuously monitor 24-7. Question becomes, how are you going to monitor? Classic would be cameras, guards, or dogs. They're not all equally viable. Dogs can have a lot of legal implication when they bite somebody that was authorized, but not at a time that was expected. Even though it was OK authorized, they just were caught off guard. So the amount of money you pour into it is going to be a part of your selection. They tend to say that guards are more expensive than dogs. I always say it depends. Um, but certainly if you own the guards, then in fact they tend to be more responsible or dedicated to you because they're an employee of your company versus someone who's just contracted out. But here again, it depends. If you employ them and you don't treat them well, well then they may be less effective than somebody that you contracted out to. Of course, if you're not treating them right, you're probably going to have problems from your other employees too. So what solution you come up with depends. You may want to have a group of these that, again, nested layered controls. One of the indications with your security cameras to be aware of is you want to make sure that these security cameras able to be jammed. You don't want to have wireless security cameras. Again, once they're jammed, you're no longer recording. You also want to make sure that if they're the kind that can move and follow motion, you usually want to have some that are dedicated somewhere so that they can't be distracting you by moving one camera while something goes on somewhere else. So in other words, not only do you possibly want layers of guards and cameras and dogs, but within one of them, like cameras, having multiple, within guards, having multiple guard points. And when we talk physical intrusion detection, understand there's many different types. I mentioned already that PIR, passive infrared detection, is being one of the most classic. But we have acoustic detectors, which are very capable for just listening for the noise. Seismic is classic if you're in a place where you could have mud slides or any type of an earthquake. And shatter would be appropriate if it's a matter of an office window cracking. I mean, it could be an office next to you that doesn't even belong to you, but you still might be able to want to be listening for the noise of it. So here again, choosing the appropriate detection system will be very important. All of these detection systems can be bypassed or circumvented, things like having the power cut, so once again, you have to make sure they're professionally installed and maintained. As you are deploying your access controls, remember people are your weakest link. So have tight control on who can come in the building, how far they can go, what kind of points of reference you'll have for visitors to check in, perhaps be escorted, any kind of restrictions for where they can go. Clearly identify places around your building, not just for the visitors, but where you're going to have deliveries dropped off at. So there's none of this, well, I'm looking for so-and-so. I just happen to be here in this back office space. That never should be able to happen in the first place. You don't want the wrong people getting in. When we're talking about your log files, keep in mind it isn't just the permitted visits or the permitted deliveries. It's both allowed and disallowed since both success and failure could be a sign of an attack. Most important issue we have with the log files as far as mismanagement or improper oversight is getting people to review those log files. So don't simply manage to maintain them with sufficient level of detail, but make sure they're being reviewed periodically. One of the growing areas of complexity in our physical security is mobile assets. And the term that is getting very popular is MDM, Mobile Device Management Software, where we can push out what kind of restrictions we want to have. 
in all cases for whatever you provide in your organization, whether it's how you will have an organization physically arranged, whether it is what will be the access you grant, what will be the firewalling uh, stop points that you provide in traffic, you always have to define in policy first what it is you want before someone can configure it. And the same thing happens with our mobile devices. Unfortunately, everybody seems to have run into bring your own device without proper management first, without planning it, without figuring out how are we going to use these things. It has simply been looked at as, what a cost saving. Let everybody bring their own devices. We don't have to buy them anymore. And unfortunately, then people are using them for personal and business activity, and the lines blur between which is which, and data starts moving across those boundaries too easily. So it's usually recommended if you didn't have to have a mobile device for business, don't let them bring it into the organization in the first place. If you are going to have the device, here's one great way to marry up cloud computing. Make it such that, sure, you can have your own device. However, no corporate data will ever be on it. Everything has to be in the cloud. Now, you have all the cloud considerations, but you've removed it from being an issue with your employee. Finally, to the extent that people are using their devices, you have to prepare them for the fact you might need to re uh, acquire an image of that device in a forensic investigation. By nature of it being in the organization, when you in fact suffered some type of infraction, you may not have a choice. Everything about whatever happened, the forensic investigators may come in and declare with subpoenas and search warrants, they have to grab an image of it. People are going to have entire fits of, absolutely not. This is my whole life. You can't have my pictures, my phone book. Well, guess what? You should have figured that all out before you were in that situation. So again, if BYOD is going to be allowed within your organization, make sure that you've come up with your policy over how they can be used. Make sure within your acceptable use, you spell out this possibility that you might have to acquire it and get them to sign off on it. You must have them be aware of this, or again, there's going to be all kinds of issues. Tracking your assets is another issue. It could be that you are providing them with devices that they'll use. Sometimes companies provide their mobile device and then say, but you can use it for personal use as well. Well, again, dictate this possibility of forensic acquisition and dictate how it will be utilized. Now you have to track your assets on top of that. It's your corporate assets. So RFID is actually gaining a lot of popularity. We have RFID tags, and then we have sensors that have been scattered around entire campuses to track and play back every place that device has been moved to across the campus for as long as you maintain the records. That would be one means of doing it. There's um, PC phone home. I mean, it depends on the device exactly what kind of mechanism you want to use. GPS tracking is one of these that some people want it, some people don't. I hear, well, because it has sensitive information, I absolutely want it tracked with GPS. I can locate it at any time. Or I'll hear management say, because it has sensitive information, I never want it GPS tracked. I don't want anyone to be able to tell where it is. That's a management decision. But again, spelled out in policy, it becomes something you can push out to the organization. One way or another, determine how you will track and to what extent you will track. Get it in policy, have people sign off on their acceptance of the terms and that they will abide by it, and then monitor and enforce. Your whole goal is to make sure that security is an everyday approach to whatever it is that your employees perform. You need to protect your people first. That is, again, going to help cut down on disgruntled employees, and people are going to want to help you more because they know you're taking care of them. Furthermore, as we put all these demands on people for BYOD and for communication and the monitoring, they start feeling like shrooms, you know, in a closet being fed what shrooms get fed. You need to explain to them why you have the expectations that you do. And as they understand a little bit of why it's important, they typically want to cooperate. The ones that don't tend to either not have been a good employee pick in the first place, or they weren't going to cooperate anyway because they have other motives. For the most part, people will help you if they understand why it was important. 
And as we move into so much to do with security, it's compartmentalized information. People have to be trained what they need to know, and sometimes you don't want them to know too much. So that gives even more importance that they understand why their assignment is being critical. Back to our first line of defense, people-wise, that's typically a receptionist. What is the one place where we tend more than any other to have temporary staff because an employee is out is a receptionist. So remember the importance of it being your first line of defense and only allow people to be there that have been properly trained. Again, define everything in corporate policy because governance is what shapes human behavior. Different types of governance like your acceptable use policy, your ethics policy, you want to get signatures on so that you have a way to take people to court if in fact they will fully disobey what they have accepted. We live in an, a voluntary workforce. If they don't like what you're asking of them, they can go work somewhere else. So aside from asking them to break the law or debasing them as a human being, you can basically ask anything you want. And then if they don't like it, they can work somewhere else. But if they are willing to accept the terms, you've got to get written signature from them so that you can hold them to it. Again, remember to track your assets and stay on top of these keys that we assign to people. That's another one of your assets. You're going to have to re-key doors regularly if you have people turning over. For all the governance that you create, your policies, your standards, your procedures, your non-disclosure agreements, all of these you need to re uh, view at least annually to make sure they're still appropriate. So some of them, like policy, are strategic. You want them to last three to five years. The others, more tactical, you want them one to three years. But all of them need to be reviewed and then updated as appropriate. Define your expectations for your employees in that acceptable use policy. This is one of the most important policies for removing their expectation of privacy. I will monitor to whatever level you plan to monitor. I will maybe have honeypots inside that you're not supposed to interact with. You should be saying what the penalties are anytime that you demand that they perform something. You should define how you're going to be following up. And you should make it obvious that across the board, everyone must apply or everyone must comply with it. Back to that idea of monitoring, cameras, keystroke logging, or any time that you intercept their SSL or SSH tunnels, these have to be in the acceptable use policy. Then identify due care policies. This is where you're explaining to your people how you want them to behave in such a way that they are demonstrating due care. This helps keep them from needing to make decisions themselves, given that everybody has their own idea of common sense. Instead, you will discreetly tell them everything along the way of how you want them to take due care. And in here, it's important to create your classification policy. Given that raw data can be encountered in the workplace, you want them to clearly understand that when you encounter this kind of data, this is the classification it is, and therefore, here is how we need to protect it. As much as possible, you want to make sure that all data is clearly marked with the highest level of security as to how it needs to be protected. And again, penalties for failure to comply, designated and enforced. Ethical behavior is important. This is going to set forth how you expect people to behave when they're representing your company. It can be dress code how they can talk, how they can communicate, what kind of things you expect them to say, what kind of things you don't want them to say. Again, as long as you're not debasing them, you can ask anything of them, but you should get their signature on it so that they agree. Security is a process. You don't achieve it one day and you get your little star and therefore now we can move on to other things. Everything about the environment has to be regularly reviewed. You have to do trending. You have to have constant improvement as part of your life cycle of handling the infractions, handling any kind of incidents. And one good feature in all of this is to accept your employee feedback. I keep saying respect your employees, but if you receive feedback and input from them, they feel even more a part of the solution. And again, they're going to become more dedicated to making sure that it works. 
So as you review everything for appropriateness, involve your people to the extent that, again, it's appropriate. Use layered security and regularly recognize how everything about nature evolves everything about equipment, how we're using it, how our processes need to work. And the only way you can keep pace with it is to regularly review and make sure that your solutions are still appropriate. I invite you to visit our Knowledge Center or attend additional courses for greater detail. And I thank you for coming today. Don't forget to claim your point of continuing education if you're maintaining any of these certifications. And take care.